here because we love you and we know how you love us, or at least we are trying to figure that out. We ask that you would uh, bless us all here. Those of us who are learning and trying to understand you are most often afraid. Um, and our fear sometimes rules our lives. And we're trying not to be afraid. We're trying to actually be bold. And in our boldness, Father, we ask to please you. And we ask that you would give us all that we need to not only be bold, but be, uh, to be different, to be recognized as being different, to have others point at us and say, who are those people? Why are they so happy? And have us have an answer. We need an answer. And we're working toward that all along. We ask that your will be done here and that you would uh, keep the evil one out. Uh, he's not happy about what we're doing here. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I think you should flip over to Colossians 3.12. <clears throat> Colossians 3.12. I'd like to take a minute and thank everyone who came Amen. to the Manhattan Cafe. Let me tell you something. I, all, I'm not kidding you. We had a blast. David was singing like Frank Sinatra all night long. He was. Steve called me Flank Sinatra. Flank Sinatra. Yeah. He had on a cool hat and, and Manhattan in the background. It was awesome. And I even want to thank those of you who didn't come because you gave us somebody to talk about. Um, <laughs> and next time you should show up, I can tell you that's all I got to say about that. Thank you all for coming. We uh, managed to uh, have a good time and, uh, and collect a little money. And uh, um, I hope you can get back on your diet. I just hope you can. <laughs> uh, some of that food, my goodness. Okay. Colossians 3.12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Now, one of the things that I want to point out here is a sequence at what point are we holy and dearly loved in this passage? Okay, since we were chosen. In the beginning of this passage, we are holy and dearly loved. Do you notice that it is describing that we are loved before it even, you start the process of doing these things that it's describing in Colossians 3.12. We tend to flip that. We tend to think we have to do these things before we're loved. And that's one of the things that we've been discussing this whole time is at what point God loves us. And this passage, like many that we talked about, is makes it very clear that He loved us before we could do anything. From the beginning that we were loved. And it describes these things that we're supposed, to, we're supposed to put on. Now, when I read this, what stands out to me is that it says, clothe yourselves. When you put something on, do you already have it on? No. No, when you clothe yourselves, you're actually putting something on over whatever you either don't have on or already have on, right? Right? So you're actually adding something new. You're clothing yourselves. You add something, you know, when you put on a jacket, that's something that you add to what you're already, what you're already doing. And this passage is talking about putting some things on that you might not already have. It's talking about adding some things. And it's talking about adding some things that might not come naturally to you. These are things that are going to be different. Things that might be... Uh, hard to implement. You're adding new things here. And you're not adding them in order to gain love. You're adding them because you are loved. So some of these words, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, 
How similar is that to what we've looked at in 1 Corinthians when it talks about love? How similar is that description to what is described as love? The words are very, very similar. Okay, so we're supposed to be adding these things to that persona that we're being asked to learn to develop under God's guidance. So these are things that we may not have now. We're going to add them. We're going to put them on. We're going to wrap them around us. Now, when you have on clothes, do people see you or do they see the clothes you're wearing? A little bit of both, right? Right? A little bit of both. Okay. You never heard the term dress for success, you know? Is that what you put on is how people see you often, right? So if I show up to my office in flip-flops and, you know, shorts, how are they going to perceive me? Not very professional, which actually the office I work at you can get away with, but you understand my point. The place I used to work at, we were just lucky people showed up in pants, so, you know. Um, the, uh, what we're talking about is, is, is basically is that you're changing how people are going to see you. Is that if I, if, I start, if I start dressing for success, what I'm dressing for is I'm dressing so that people perceive me in a certain way. Now that can be a bad thing. It can be a good thing, depending on what you're putting on. So what this is saying is start putting these things on. They're going to see you, but they're going to start seeing some things that are not you. They're going to see some things that you're going to be adding on. They're going to see new stuff in you. And what we've been learning about these last several weeks is that what God can do is He can have you be seen however He wants you to be seen. And so if we are relying on Him for the things that He can give us, the power that He can bring to bear for us, just like He brought for His Son, then people will start seeing that instead of the things that we might have been bringing to the table before. But they're going to see that, and we're going, to, we're going to touch on this a little bit, they're going to see that basically with you. So what's the importance of that? So being able to see you and these things, what's the importance? Maybe they know you, and they know who you are, and now suddenly they're seeing something different, and it's because of the addition of Christ. Seeing the difference. Being able to see a change. When we talk about being able to see your weakness, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about being able, someone being able to see you and going, that's different than what I saw before. And so people have to know what you were to know what you've become, right? So what we're talking about is basically, at whatever point you're in in your walk, being okay with being vulnerable. Being okay with allowing people to see that you are not perfect and that you don't have it all together. So what we're talking about is actually being a little proactive in our vulnerability. Premeditated? Premeditated vulnerability. <laughs> really? It's a great way to say it. It's a great way to say it. Mm. So the question is, how do we start? How do we start premeditated vulnerability? Now, when we talk in Colossians 3.12, it talks about adding some things on. Okay, if you're putting something on, okay, if you're used to wearing shorts and flip-flops, how comfortable are you in a suit? Not. <laughs> Not at all. Okay? I, I remember when I first got, got my, my first job and I had to dress up, and I mean, it just like that tie just made me feel like someone was hanging me, you know? That it just was so uncomfortable. I did not like it. it, was, it but after a while, you start getting used to it. You start getting comfortable with it. So what we're talking about, premeditated vulnerability, is talking about being in situations that you are uncomfortable. These are things that do not come naturally to you. And you are in a situation where, man, it's like the Indiana Jones thing we talked about last week, right? Close your eyes, take that step. And you trust that God's going to take care of the rest. We're going to talk about a term that may make some of you uncomfortable. We're going to talk about experimenting with God. 
Does that make anybody uncomfortable for me to say that? Experiment, okay. We didn't okay. say experiment with whether there was one or not. <laughs> Do you get that part? Okay, that's not what we're doing. Okay. We talked about some guys last week. We talked about Gideon. Who remembers the story of Gideon? Okay. We've got one person. One person. That wow. Story. All right. Thank you. Thank oh, you. Man, that's awesome. We need coffee in here. Stat. All right. Um, <laughs> Gideon was a man who was handpicked by God to lead his people. God came to him and said, I'm picking you. Okay. And Gideon was scared. So he asked for some evidence. Why did Gideon need evidence? Because he, lack of faith, because he's human, because he's like you and me. Would you need it? Every day. If God came here and said, come on, come with me, take my hand. Mm -hmm. Would you need it? Mm -hmm. As soon as you picked yourself up off the floor, you might actually need that. You might be so out of your realm and your normalcy, do you understand? that you might actually call for that, some reassurance that everything's going to be okay. Not just proof that he is God or is there a God, but am I going to be okay in this? Think about that. Am I going to be all right here? Do you like reassurance from your doctor? Ah, this is nothing. We'll take care of this. I'll give you a few pills. You'll be okay in a couple of days. You're going to be fine. Don't you love that? Can you like go on about life without worrying after that? Would you need that? If God came down here and said, come go with me. Come on, we're going to go to Nineveh together. Well, I don't like those people there. Matter of fact, I have a resentment about that. So think about what that might be like to need his reassurance. And, it may, and we're not talking about whether there is or is not a God or whether you believe there is or is not a God. Some of that problem may be what you think about yourself. Often when God would call people, they would say, Me? Are you serious? Do you know who I am? So often, it's not that these people that we read about, and I'm so thankful that this is in the Bible. I'm so thankful that they saw fit to put this down. Because we're able to look at that and go, Okay, I'm not the only one that's human. Moses, I mean, this guy defines leadership. In the Bible, right? When you talk about, okay, who was, who was a great leader who did amazing things? Moses comes to mind, right? So when God came to Moses and said, Moses, I need you to do this. He said, yep, I'm on it. All right, let's go, right? He did that thing of going, me? Looking around for the other guy that God must be talking to. He even had another guy. Oh, how about my brother? Yeah. Why don't you take him instead? And God provided what he needed. He like threw his brother under the bus, you know? <laughs> didn't he? Take him, take him, take him. Oh, yeah, he probably grew up doing that, though, right. didn't he? Yeah. So we're not talking about experimenting mm -hmm. with whether God exists. We're talking about experimenting, to some extent, with us being comfortable that he is there and working. Because I know for me, one of the things, <clears throat> there, there's, a, and there's a bit of process here that, 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 that we'll get in, I think we'll get into later. But basically... For me, I saw God working in other people's lives before I saw him working in mine. Anybody else have that experience? Huh? Really, hold your hand up if you have. Seen somebody else's life activated, do you understand, by God? Thank you. Okay. Uh, and before you actually maybe had a chance to see him in your own. Um, that's typical. Not abandonment. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Or it could make us angry. In our humanness, it could make us angry that things are working out for someone else. And it is possible, yeah, for us to feel abandoned, do you understand, by him. If we see him doing things for someone else, and we've been asking and asking and asking, and nothing seems to be happening in our life. However, I can tell you about miracles if you want me to. Do we have time for that? Yeah. Why are there miracles? 
Why do we even have miraculous looking things like what we see happening in other people's lives? Why would he do that, do you understand, and not uh, do it everywhere? Well, let's, let's ask the question this way then, okay? When people pray to God for miraculous things, are they not praying, do you understand, with a sense of urgency and sincerity that's not frivolous? I'm talking about that kind of praying for a miraculous intervention. People don't normally do that, do you understand, unless they're frightened, afraid, absolutely powerless, need him more than ever, that kind of thing. So I'm talking about those kinds of prayers, do you understand? What would happen if this place right here, what would it be like if everyone who prayed with that level of sincerity got their miracle? Heaven. What would this place be like? Heaven. heaven. Can this place be like heaven? Not as long as the one that rules the air here is here, it never will be. So a glimpse of heaven is probably all you're going to get here, and it might happen in someone else. Does that make you feel different now about watching it happen in someone else's life? It still has intention, do you understand? And it's for your comfort that you even get to see those kinds of things. Unless you're so screaming self-centered and you're throwing such a three-year-old fit that you didn't get something that you can't get out of yourself long enough to recognize why he's doing that that way. I think I'll stop there. <laughs> so when we talk about experimentation, what we're actually talking about is becoming more God-conscious. Being more aware. Having our eyes open to what he might be doing in somebody else's life and in your life. So really what we're talking about is getting out of that self-centered person a little bit as much as, as much as we can to be able to perceive as much as we can what God might be doing that we have just been missing. How powerful is hindsight? How many of you can look back and see times in your life when God was working that at the time, you had no clue. You might have been wondering where he was. At that time, you might very well have been going, God, where are you? I'm talking to you and I don't see anything. These are things we're, we're scared to talk about. We're scared to say these things, yet I see how many heads are nodding that have been there. And so, we can look back and we can see this timeline. I can go... I, if it probably I, could, I can go back further. I can go back to 2001 when my dad died and I can see a path of God starting to change me. I had no clue at the time that's what he was doing. But it was a long process and he started, I, I can look clearly back there and I remember the first realization that I had had about I wanted to be something different I had at that time. And so we can look back in our lives and we see this path in retrospect. What we want to start doing is being aware now of what he might be doing. Because we can look back and we can go, yeah, he did that, but why is it when we turn in today and tomorrow that we wonder if he's going to be there, even if we can look back? So what we're going to be talking about is being aware as much as possible in the moment that you're in. That's what James chapter 1, I'm taking up all the time, sorry. No, you're doing great. <laughs> you're absolutely, just tell them what, they may have a question about what is the difference in hindsight and present sight? What is removed from us or added to us, however you want to look at that, in hindsight that we don't have in present sight that allows us to see the movement and the workings of God possibly in a clearer sort of way with a distance kind of thing. What is it that changes in us that allows us to see that because you understand that he wasn't hiding in the present as you were there he wasn't hiding there's something about you that kept that from happening that kept you from seeing it at that moment what do you think it might be what do you think he either took away from you or gave to you in the hindsight end you have any idea Okay. Uh, more often than not, our emotional side is heightened, you understand, to the degree that it creates a level of blindness about him uh, and how he's working that uh, we, we can talk about some other time. 
Um, how many of you have ever had the opportunity to look back at a line you said you'd never cross? Oh, I'm getting somewhere here. Okay, <laughs> and do you know now more about yourself, not only about yourself, do you understand, but about your blindness, do you understand, uh, to that whole thing. And uh, now you have some real wisdom about that that you didn't have before. Okay, uh, you're, 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 you're going to have to remember, folks, that we are easily distracted as human beings. Uh, more often than not, we're our own worst enemy. And one of the reasons God said we need community is so that uh, we can engage each other, do you understand, in ways that allow us to ask for and to more often than not get wisdom and good counsel from our brothers and our sisters. How many of you can just watch TV and see somebody on TV portraying a character and you know that's not going to end well. But they aren't in that manner of thinking right now. What is it that's distracting them? Could their own self-centered desires get in the way? Could yours? Are we complicated that way? Are we easily distracted like that? Are we easily confused? You understand you have to be sufficiently confused before you can be successfully lied to. Oh, who knows that about you? I'll say no more about that, but I think you understand what I'm saying. So some of the things we're going to start talking about over the next few weeks, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to be talking in terms of experimentation, which is really basically saying trying to make sure our eyes are open to a variety of things. Um, if, if a scientist is doing an experiment and that experiment fails, does a scientist look at himself as failing or the experiment as having failed? The experiment, okay? That's how I'm going to ask you to approach this. I learned that from Steve, by the way. Just <laughs> stealing his stuff. Um, the, uh, but basically no. what we're going to... He stole from somebody else. I did. Um, we're basically going to be talking about looking at something. Okay, because we can be so easily confused and distracted, we might do something and we might actually miss what's happening. Okay? So what I'm going to say is, okay, we're going to try some things. And you may come, what I'm going to do is ask you to be watchful for some things. I'm going to ask you to try some things. And then I'm going to ask some of you to come back and talk about what you might have seen, what you might have experienced. Some of you may go, I didn't, I didn't get a thing. And it's okay. It's an experiment. We'll try again. Gideon did it. Gideon did it twice, right? He got his answer clearly, and he still asked again. So as we're going through this, if you're not seeing something, I don't want you to feel like that you have to go, ooh, you know, I can't ask again. I ask God once. Because we have, time and time again, great men of God, great leaders saying, still not sure, still not sure. Can, I, can, can you help me out again? Can, can I see some more? Okay. So, so that's something where let's look at the experiment as having failed, not us as having failed, okay? Um, we basically use this information for improvement, not as condemnation of ourselves or a label for ourselves. And one of the things that we should do overall is make sure that not only ourselves but other people feel safe in the eyes of God to experiment. So, what happens as you, if you have, okay, if you're developing a friendship, you're developing a relationship, do you immediately throw everything and compl be completely vulnerable in a relationship from the very beginning? You kind of slowly let things out. That's, nat that's, how, that's how we're wired. That's natural. Because we're afraid that we put too much out someone's going to see it and react badly, or we're going to get hurt. Okay? But what happens over time as you allow that vulnerability to happen? You build trust. You build trust. You build confidence. Okay? That's exactly what we're talking about here, is that as we let some of those vulnerabilities show to God, we admit them to God, and we admit them to other people, we let people, other people see those vulnerabilities in us, 
how is our trust level with God going to increase as He delivers what we need? So every time that you see Him being active, then that just makes you that much more confident and that much more willing to trust. I had a man tell me the other day, he said, can you guess what my, what my vulnerabilities are? And uh, I don't know why he decided to test me that way, but he wanted to. And, and I said, well, yeah, I have an idea. He said, well, you'd have to also know what my greatest fear is. And I said, well, I think I know that too. And we had had lots of conversation, you understand. I'm not a mind reader. It was simply a, uh, a deducing of what might have cr been created in him uh, as, uh, according to what his past experiences have been. And I saw him as being uh, fearful of abandonment. And I said, I think you have an abandonment issue. And he said, no, I'm scared to death of dying. I said, isn't that an abandonment issue? He said, I don't think I've ever seen that in myself that way. I said, you're scared to death of losing people. You're not scared of dying, death. He's a Christian, been a Christian all his life. Why would a Christian who's got what Christians have be afraid of dying? He wasn't afraid of dying. He was afraid of losing his family, not being there with them, do you understand? And everything else that he knew as comforting, do you understand? And those people, we never put them together. We have a hard time doing that for ourselves sometimes. Sometimes I need a brother or sister that can help me with that. He needed somebody to help him put that together. He's not afraid of dying. Probably not a good idea for him to go around telling anybody that as a Christian. It's not good advertising, is it? <laughs> He's not good advertising for Christ. What is he? He's afraid of losing relationships, do you understand? He has a lot there. Is he now, because of his relationship fear, also beginning to realize and understand he might have an idol in his life? And they may be humans and the relationships that he has. He may have stronger relationships with humans than he does with God and rely on them the way he wants to rely on God and can't. Gosh, there's a trail of crumbs right there, isn't there? That sometimes develops us, do you understand, into who we become as a result of what we have done here on the planet, not even know anything about the actual definition of who he intended for us to be. I don't think God intended for him to have abandonment issues and be afraid of dying in his own mind and see the oxymoron of all of that as a Christian. I don't know, you suppose he felt guilty about that? Feeling fear of dying and being a Christian at the same time? He may have. He may know in his heart, I'm not supposed to feel this way. This is not the way I'm supposed to feel. And his journey toward knowing who he was supposed to have always been was to be liberated from those things. His knowledge of them would have to be available first. And sometimes we can help people with that. Sometimes you can help yourself with that. One of the things that Steve and I have talked about is, is, is the idea that people People come into James' group with a big problem. They are fearful of engaging God because they see their problem as something bigger than God can handle. So what is the focus when those people come in, Steve? Um, first of all, they're, 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 <laughs> they're suffering from terminal uniqueness. Um, all that really means is, is they think they're the only ones. Uh, that think that way. Uh, and, th and they have absolutely no idea what to do with something they're that powerless over. They don't know how powerful God can be. Um, they have made their God uh, so small, I guess, uh, in their problem, do you understand, because nothing is happening. Uh, their prayers don't seem to be doing anything but hitting the ceiling. And uh, they've tried to uh, let's make a deal thing with God, and that hasn't worked. They don't realize that they've got work to do on themselves 
and that God's not going to do that for them because they're not able to see what they need to see without working on themselves and making room for him. Their addiction has crowded him out and made him small because it now has charge of their lives in a way that is more powerful than he may have been in them before. that answer your question? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that Steve has talked about is we have to focus on building up their point of view of God so they see him as bigger than their problem. So to some of the extent, we have to take them down to a level so that they know that he will be there when they call on him. Nobody starts relying on God without seeing him first. We've talked already about Mo Moses. We talked about Gideon. We can look at Daniel. We can look at Ezekiel. We can look at Paul. These are men who needed to see God first. They needed to see something to wake them up, to send them in a new direction. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 talks about having treasures and jars of clay. Probably have your own mental image of what that looks like. <laughs> Uh, my mental image is that you've got this, this jar that's got broken pieces and there's light kind of shining through where the broken pieces are. Um, and, 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 and that's kind of what I envision, that, that when people see me, may, I, I kind of hope that's what they're seeing, that despite my flaws, they're seeing at least little bits of God shining through. But what, that's basically what he's talking about, is that in your humanness, I can shine through you. Um, we talk, uh, Corinthians chapter 12 verses 9 through, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 9 through 10 talks about how God's power is perfected in weakness. Uh, for when, when I am weak, then I am strong because he's working through me. Romans chapter 5 verses 2 through 5 talk about these difficulties, how these difficulties develop the very things that bring us closer to God. These things that we go through, these struggles are the ones that actually bring us closer to God. So in some ways, our humanity and seeing what he can do with our humanity is what can bring us closer to God. There's a couple of things we're going to ask you to do this week. I forgot to get rubber bands. No, that's okay. I got those. Okay. All right. First thing I'm going to ask you to do is I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask you to try to be something different. I'm going to ask you to be aware of something. What I'm going to ask you to do this week is simply be aware of when you are impatient. We can, we can let them get their own rubber bands. Yeah. Okay. I, how, many, how many people have already done the rubber band deal? Know what I'm talking about. Okay. All right. And some people are going, I don't think I like this. <laughs> um, when, I, when I came to Steve and I was like, Steve, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm seeking something that I don't know how to find. One of the things that he did was he said, you need to become aware of some things. You need to become aware of some things first. And what he did was he, say, he said, okay, here's this giant rubber band. And I'm, and I'm, it was, it's a big rubber band. He said, every time that you think about these things that are your distraction, I want you to grab that rubber band, pull it back, as far as you can and let it fly. It and was I mean, right here. You understand smack. that? Smack. Right on the wrist, okay? Tends to make you aware. Okay? What really makes you aware is when you realize, man, I gotta pull that rubber band back again. And again. And again. And then you go, I gotta change wrists. Man, I'm wearing this one out. So what what I've what, had people come in my office and the rubber band's gone, you know? So where's the rubber band? And they pull up their pant leg. They got it, on, they got it down here now. <laughs> so what I'm going to ask you to do, find a rubber band or make a check mark or whatever you want to do. I want you this week to simply be aware of when you are impatient. Make a note. Make a list. Pop yourself with a rubber band. Whatever you need to do to be aware. Here's where you'll be if you're impatient. Here's what impatience will look like. You will either be thinking in futuristic terms, 
like what you're going to do about a problem tomorrow or the next day or the next day, or you will be in the past and you will be trying to fix something or trying to figure out how you made that mistake or wish you could go back and correct that, you will be either futuristically thinking or thinking retroactively. You will either be in the wreckage of the future or the wreckage of the past. You will have left the precious present. The right here, right now place. Right here and right now is where the Spirit can reach you, comfort you, and teach you. And God is active in your life. He's not active in your future. And if you are, here's what you'll do. You'll be worrying about tomorrow. There's a whole bunch in here about worrying if you want to read about that. But if you're worrying about what's going on tomorrow, you're not paying attention to what's going on right now. Do you suppose your stress levels are higher? What about back there? Do you suppose your stress levels will be higher? You will find yourself in the most peaceful place you've ever, ever existed the longer you can manage to stay where he can help you. You will suck at this. Do you understand that? You are going to be really bad at this. You are futuristically planning someone else's demise. That's called a resentment. Or wishing that you could go back and do something to them you should have said. Or go back and wish you could have kept your mouth shut back then. Or some other kind of out-of-body thing that's happening. You're taking trips and not leaving the farm. People do that to smoke pot. You don't have to smoke pot to do that. I can tell you that right now. You do it all the time. And I'll tell you this. About 90% of the anxiety that you create for yourself is born right there. And your pace of life is not being set by God anymore. It's being set by you. Y'all ever see a hound dog? You know what hound dogs look like, right? Their lips are like really hang down like this. And they have really giant ears. You ever see them with their head out of pickup truck window going about 60 miles an hour? The slobber is flying, do you understand? And the ears are flapping all over the place. You can tell that dog was never meant to go 60 miles an hour. <laughs> That's what you look like. You want to try this? Let me give you a quick, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a quick example of how this worked with me. So maybe, because it, it's actually, it, 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 it can sneak up on you, okay? So... <laughs> I've told you before, I'm extremely approval oriented, extremely approval oriented. So you can think about how that might play out at work. So I had an assignment to do a presentation and I had just like next to zero information to do it. So I, I spent a lot of time putting this presentation together. And when we showed it, the guy that owns our company said, man, I'm really disappointed in this. So let me tell you where I went with that, okay? And this is being aware of this scenario. But where I went was, A, I'm going to go find a new job. They don't appreciate me here. I'm going to go find a new job. So immediately I'm thinking, okay, i got to find a new job. Part of that is because I thought for sure I was going to lose my job. And when the owner of the company tells you you're not happy with what you did, I'm, I'm already down the road and, I, and I'm already getting handed the pink slip. Okay? Then the other part is I'm mad. You didn't tell me anything to make this presentation. I didn't get any information from you. And I was mad. And I was resentful. <laughs> I went back to my desk, got the rubber band, <laughs> put it on my wrist. And it took me two weeks to work through that. In the past, that probably would have been with me for three to six months, something like that. And I would have been working around the clock trying to reprove myself. So I'd have been looking for a new job. All those things would have come into play off of that one little event when all I really had to do was rework the presentation. So that's how these things can play out. Does that make sense to you? Do you, do you understand kind of what I'm getting at? It's, it's the, it, these things will happen and they will send you off scurrying in multiple directions at one time. 
And, and those things will just alternate like this. And, you're gonna, and, and it just sends you into a frenzy. Okay? That's what I'm asking you to be aware of. That's impatience right there. That is being impatient with the situation that you're in, not content. That's what I want you to be aware of. I'm done. You want to? Um, okay. See this rubber band <laughs> around here? Can y'all see this rubber band? You show up in here with that rubber band, I'm going to give you one that you need. <laughs> you see this rubber band? This is for wimps. I want the rubber band to be at least a quarter of an inch thick. Big, fat rubber band. <laughs> Do you understand me? Don't be coming in here with this little weasel right here. Okay? Here's the deal. Pain has a tendency to bring us back to the right now, doesn't it? How many of you have been walking through the house trying to figure out what you were going to eat out of the refrigerator and you stub your toe and the refrigerator is no longer on your mind? Is it? Okay. Every time to understand that you pop yourself with that rubber band, there's some Pavlov's dog thing going on here. You know who that was? He's the scientist back in the 17th century, I think, that walked into his laboratory with a big stake for his, for his dog in the cage, and he noted that it started it slobbering. And when he didn't walk in with it, it didn't slobber. Elementary. When you have enough pain, discomfort happen to you, it brings you, do you understand, where God is. There are some people in Connecticut experiencing that today. 9-11 made us think of him, did it not? How many times are we going to have to go through the negative things this planet produces in our lives before we start getting the idea that maybe God might be important every day. Not that he sends the messages, do you understand, through those things and makes those things happen so that they'll happen. It's the natural consequences of living on the planet that causes us difficulty but I'll tell you this, I've caused myself more pain than the planet ever has. And I just keep going back to that lethargic life of living in the future or the past and dreaming. How many of y'all buy lottery tickets? You know, they're not selling you a chance at money. They're selling you a chance at dreaming about money. And you pay your dollar and you dream till they call the next number and then they sell you another one. Are you living in the future when you're doing that? You're like totally confumed with future... Confumed. That's a good, good word. It's a good word. Ooh. Thank you. Trademark. Confumed. I love that. That's like, okay, there's nothing of any good happening up here. It's confumed. <laughs> if, if you don't understand from the time we get started with this class till we end, how Satan is going to kill and destroy not only the church, but Christianity itself. If you don't get the idea by the time we get done with you, you were asleep in here. This is evil at work. I have just experienced what you're talking about. <laughs> Trying to sell my house that fell through twice and then I sold it and then moving from Arizona to Texas. I realized my impatience, I was wrapped up in myself. I realized it and I prayed about it and I'm still praying about it. <laughs> but I mean, that's exactly what you're talking about. Yes, ma'am, it is. You're exactly right. I had everything just rolling around. Mm -hmm. And all I could think about was myself. Yeah. We're walking the planet looking for a visual God. All of you are. We are susceptible, do you understand, to visual gods, to little G gods. Do you understand that? to idolatrous living. We are. And, and we have to be really, really, really careful about that. We have to really watch out for it because we are so easily distracted. We're as easily distracted by something we want as we are by something we fear. 
th think about this. We're going to have to live in between these two places, and that's where the present is. So keep that in mind. Right in between these two places I'm going to describe to you is where you need to live. It's where the present is. We are either living, do you understand, fearing that we're not going to get something we really, really want really bad, or we are living afraid that we're not going to get something, do you understand, that we want really bad, or that we're about to get something that we don't want really bad. We want it or we fear it. We have to live between those two places, do you understand, to be of any use to God Almighty in our kingdom, the one he has here. For us to be of any use to God, we've got to live between those two places. You will find that peace in the precious present. <coughs> practice, practice, practice. Bye. <laughs>